Welcome and welcome to those who've just joined. So I am helping Jeff in the background really try out the product pathway and to make some skills-based improvements to it because we know that the world of product is evolving and there are lots of different schools of thought around that. And I also know that the market has been evolving as well around not just product, but agility and the available roles. Um, and I know that there's a lot of anxiety about that as well. And so I've had quite a number of people ask me, Elle, do you think product coaching could be something that I can do? And the answer from my perspective is yes, depending on where your starting point is and the skills you're willing to invest in as well. And I think it's really important to remind you that Jeff gives a very good reassuring message to a lot of the people that we've been working with in the product pathway um, that you have to really take a personal uh, sense check about what is worth your time, uh, what is you know, going to be a joyful experience and investment because you could very easily allow yourself to become too far the other way with skills development. And that can really steal from your mental health. So finding that balance um, and not being in comp competition with anybody else's career is really very important in the fundamental anchor of the for everything I'm going to, to build upon on the rest of the, the presentation. So the first thing I wanna ask is who do I have with me today? And we're not gonna do a Miro or anything like that. If you're here and you're happy to come off mute, I'm gonna hit mute while you guys are speaking, but I would love to know some basic things. You know, why are you here? You know, are you interested in breaking into product coaching? Are you anxious because you're struggling to find an agile coaching role? Are you curious? Um, what's your starting point? With, what were you before you went into agile? How did you get into that? I would love to hear all of those things. Who are you and why are you here? Well, I'm, I'm Auke. I'm a trainer. I train uh, product owners and I'm a scrum master. So very interested in the uh, product. And before you were training product people, um, it, and it sounds like it's in a scrum capacity, is that right? Yeah. What were you doing before that? Uh, uh, test, test management, test engineer, this kind of stuff. And why did you get into uh, training product stuff for, for Scrum product ownership? Um, that's a, a good question. Uh, I, I got bitten by the Agile bug uh, because I saw how it brought a lot of joy to teams working uh, and unleashing the creativity of every human uh, instead of speaking uh, of workforce or more mechanical about creating products, more the, the creativity part. And I, uh, that really uh, struck me deep and I wanted to be part of that. So that's when I moved into a whatever role I could find to help uh, spread that uh, virus. <laughs> it's a good virus though. The happy kind. Good. And what do you want to get out of this? What are you hoping for today? I, I would already be happy with just one little small insight I can pass on to the next group of product owners I will be uh, seeing uh, next week. Oh, very small gains are, are great steps. Awesome. Anybody else? I, I transitioned over to yeah. James, go ahead. I, I transitioned oh. over to Agile at the start of the year from health and social care. So I was managing large teams within health and social care. So quite different. Um, and I, I'm currently a scrum master, but I'm, I'm just trying to learn as much as I can, as quickly as I can. Um, and this looked like a really good opportunity to kind of uh, get a bigger bucket of knowledge, I guess. Get a bigger bucket or fill an existing bucket, whichever analogy you like. <laughs> um, what do you want to get out of this? Just more awareness, more your seeker looking to be signposted to go on your own journey and keep continuing. 
Yeah, I, I think it's just kind of knowing different avenues that I can move towards. Um, everything's still very new and shiny. So anything, anything new and, and anything where I can expand on, it's, it's good, good for me to learn. Right. So, yeah, any kind of new paths that I can find that this would lead into is, is going to be helpful. Um, we've got a couple of, couple of comments in the chat al hendra's very similar to alka scrum master trying to help product owners uh, vs was introduced to product coaching from marty kagan when they were a former employer and got the bug there uh, somebody else is a project lead and a scrum master and a product owner uh, find product management very interesting so curious about what product coaching is it's a relatively new term i think uh, Becca has heard about you personally and is intrigued to see what she can learn today. She's an agile coach uh, uh, in tech and non-tech for a while. Okay, cool. If anybody else wants the floor, this is your moment to tell me a little about about you. Hi, I'm Vita. I'm currently working as a Scrum Master and did my agile coaching as well. So I'm more interested to learn and explore different ways of coaching because agile coaching, product coaching, so there are different ways. And I'm I'm basically, my background is like from medical sciences, not a doctor though. <laughs> so more into the genetic stuff, but I don't know how I ended up, but uh, because of my husband, I should say he's a developer. So I moved into software testing and eventually got my sons and turning into a scrum master somehow. But I used to work as a product person before, entirely with hardware product, not with an agile approach. So I'm more like want to explore more about like oh, what are the different techniques and coaching styles and how to approach because like developing into this new product journeys or agile journeys, it's more useful. Thank you. That's me. Sweet. Brilliant. Nice. So we've got a couple more in the comments and a couple of hands up. So Shannon started as a BA, got trained as a scrum master and a product owner and product coaching as a term's caught her interest. So she's here to learn about what that is. Ash is a product owner in the NHS. So Elle's got some experience there. Uh, hoping to create a stronger product culture as he's moving into a head of product role. Uh, Suravi, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, hi. Um I can recognize myself oh, as uh, currently yeah. Scrum Master and Agile Coach. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, yeah. I started my journey as a lead for a data mining team and where I was like introduced to Kanban, but it was not formally introduced. It was just starting off Agile. Then I liked the Agile style of management. I started learning and then as a from master, I just moved to development teams, and from there, like agile coaching, currently is my uh, forte. I'm trying to learn still, and product. Uh, definitely, this product owner part and the role and their style. Lot of things to learn um, to understand their activity as well as an agile coach. So I'm here to uh, get more info and learning from here. Brilliant. Thanks, Ravi. There, there absolutely is a lot to learn. Uh, Holly? Yeah, so I'm a CPO currently, so I'm always looking for ways to improve my coaching with my team so that I can help them um, reach their potential and um, work better. And then I guess kind of something that I've got my mind on for the future is actually setting up as a product coach myself and going into other organisations and coaching them. So any advice or... Um, of how you transition into that I'm I'm interested in hearing as well nice one all right well, well we'll make sure that at the end we've got lots of space to explore those things that you want to know about okay Holly might not be here she might be at the vets but we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> make sure that you've got the recording James? I'll watch the recording <laughs> James uh thanks very much Jeff yeah I'm a, a product coach at the moment I've been product coaching for a few years um was an agile coach before that. I do differentiate between them. Um, my kind of what what switched me over the product was a meeting with Melissa Perry, and where she had um differentiated between product management and product ownership, which I really really enjoyed talking with her about it. Um, so that kind of brought me over towards more 
product coaching than agile coaching. And I've worked with quite a few people, you know, like Dave Denham and stuff like that from product elevation. Um, and I think I've met Ashley a couple of times as well at a few few meetups. So it's good to see the faces. But yeah, I, I'm just looking to see what can I learn. Um, there's always something to learn. So I'm sure that the people that are here are going to teach me something. So thank you. What's product coaching to you, James? When you uh, say, hey, product coach, what is that? Yeah, it, it's a lot of different things. Um, in my current organization, we have a lot of people who have product in their title. However, they're not really product people. So it's understanding where, where they're at, um, understanding how I can help them understand what product management is, how to be, they can become better for their teams, how they can enable their teams to deliver value on a continuous basis and strive towards outcomes over output, stuff like that. So what is a product person? Who um, are the people that you're coaching? Who are they? What accountabilities do they have? Um, the way my organization is set up, their accountabilities would more closely describe backlog managers <laughs> rather than product people. So trying to educate in and around product strategy, product vision, product goals, um, and then down into a team level when I'm working with product owners about how to create craft prop uh, sprint goals that lead to outcomes at the end of a fixed time, whatever it happens to be. Um, right down to how to write user stories. We, we have multiple different layers in our organization and different levels of knowledge. Um, a lot of people don't come from a product background, but end up in a product role. So trying to understand how they got there and how to help them actually improve their capability. Um, you know, I often recommend Jeff's book, the Product Mastery book, along with Melissa's Escaping the, the Build Trap and Marty's Empowered and Inspired. So just basically understanding where they're at and what they're trying to achieve, what the organization is trying to achieve and trying to reconcile um, the difference in their knowledge, their experience, their education, and what's needed to actually deliver the value for the customer on a continuous basis. Hey, some of you guys are probably gonna have a very shaken moment or two in this presentation, but I wouldn't be myself if I didn't do that to you a little bit, but I'll hug you at the end and you'll feel great, I promise. And I'll even uh, give you my contact details and I'll help you through it. And of course there's the product pathway if you wanna become a pathway person, um, but, persevere. It will not be overwhelming. I promise. And I'm going to tell you how I went about this because a lot of what I've just heard, I would argue is not product coaching at all. Okay. Anyone here shooketh? Can I shake you to the fiber of your very being? Isn't that what it's about? That's why we're here. <laughs> okay. Awesome. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to take you on a journey. And we'll give lots of chances and bear in mind, interrupt me at any point. I just may not be able to see you. Okay. So first of all, a little bit about me. So I'm a kid from the nineties who taught myself to code in my bedroom. I wasn't very good until one day I became quite good. And I used to help my teachers and then ultimately my university and I did quite well and was offered an analyst level role. That's the lowest role on the food chain at a consulting firm if I got myself to a major city, Chicago, New York, or Seattle were my options. And so I was like, hell yeah, I'm going to do that. And I got on a Greyhound bus and I went to Chicago and I decided that that was me. I was going to be a developer forevermore. I was doing front end mainly stuff. Um, and during that time, obviously we had 9-11, a lot of the world, uh, the world's major players in technology, believe it or not, had significant data centers wiped out, big impacted fleets. I We lost colleagues, things like that. And it was a real turning point in the profession, really. Um, at that time, I wasn't a scrum person. I, I was just a developer, regular schmegular <laughs> developer. And we were using something called IBM RUP at university. And they introduced something uh, called extreme programming. 
So we had, and you'll find most of your sort of newer people coming in from the graduate scheme, or perhaps they're apprentices, or it's early in their career, they'll probably have a similar thing if they've gone to any form of higher education. They are teaching Scrum at school. They're teaching Kanban at school. They're teaching Flow at, at university level. Um, I'm saying school in the American way, forgive me, but I mean higher education. Um, and that was the same for me. Now, I didn't study computer sciences, though. In fact, I, at a, a very early point, decided that an associate's degree was enough for me, and that I was all about making that money, and I'm going to go off and code, and that's exactly what I did. Um, but I was quite good with writing, and I had considered very early on in my late teens um, becoming a technical writer, I thought that that would be about release notes and writing documentation and stuff like that. So I, I did study journalism a little bit, especially at the high school level and a bit at uni. Um, and so what that ended up conditioning me to be was this technical person who could follow, obviously, because I became an extreme programming team lead at that point, um, you could follow along with the technical stuff that the team was talking about, but then explain that in a non-technical way so that it didn't overwhelm our clients. So remember, I'm consulting side. And even though I'm a tech geek at this point in my career, that was my role. We weren't talking about product. Nobody ever said, hey, kid, you want to be a product person? No, it was literally you know, one day I'm coding and I basically am working to requirements and using RUP, if you know, um, RUP at all, we, that's another talk. Um, but I become client facing, I'm explaining options. I occasionally get to talk to board level people, not at board meetings, but your C-suite type people and giving them advice. And it was very impressive for a 22 year old. And my parents were very proud and telling people L works and computers and things. Um, I, to a certain extent, would have said at that time that I considered myself a program manager, but that was my, was not my job title. Um, and then eventually that they kept calling me the product leader, the product owner. Um, again, nobody ever gave me any training in that. Um, but then eventually I had done so well commercially, I was able to save lots of deals. I was able to apply extreme programming and lean methods. And they were like, you're welcome to come over into the proper management consulting arm. And I became a classically trained management consultant at that point. So that's been kind of the, the crux of my career is learning little nuggets of things that exist in terms of profession and skills gaps and things that I needed to do and being given opportunities. Um, and I, I had literally would tell anybody since I've been five, I've been, I've been in some form of part-time education at least. Um, but I believe that that's a part of all of our paths, especially in this era. And I would like to begin that with continuous investment, continuous development in your own skills and your capabilities, balanced with right at the beginning, we talked about your mental health, looking after the whole person that is you. That's all a very important and very personal balance to take. Um, but I was always willing to do it. And I had a real hunger for doing more interesting things. I, I actually didn't want to just code in a darkened room. I didn't want people to tell me what they wanted and I just get on with it. I wanted to understand the art of possible. So I received some form of training that year. It was theory of constraints, if you know of that. And I was working on a marketing led initiative uh, for Starbucks. And again, that's marketing led. It was nothing to do with product. We weren't refer referring to ourselves as product people at that point. And, but it was all about transforming the retail customer experience. Um, so for a really long time, Starbucks had a thriving business. They were having franchises, but they just like, if you ever went to Potbellies in the late nineties or early two thousands and you ordered a sandwich in a major, uh, city, it was kind of part of the buzz, like to be shouting almost like at the bar, trying to get the attention of, of a server and get your coffee order or your sandwich order in. Um, and also predictability about when you needed peak staff. It was really straightforward. It was that classic pre-work, lunchtime, afternoon type thing, and the odd meetings or people who were doing lots of work and bringing that lap, cafe laptop culture. Um, and we knew that we were really not pleasing our customer. Um, Starbucks commissioned a ton of research and feedback around that. So it's not something that I necessarily uh, orchestrated myself, 
but a ton of actual feedback. And it was very revealing for Starbucks to hear that they didn't enjoy that. Um, so there's a huge machine around me. Don't think that this was me specifically doing all of this. Um, it takes an engine to really look at behavior change and the art of possible with it. Um, but with that, we decided that for the first time, we would have certain technology enabled change initiatives as we were calling it at that time. We weren't calling it um, digital again, that wasn't a word that people really said for a very long time. But what it was about was how might we improve a, a product proposition in store to make a, the store con experience consistent, to get those flow issues addressed. So from order out the door and also predictability around that if we can. And that was both, you know, it was a wicked problem both for the customer and obviously for our colleagues who are baristas, that's stressful, right? And customer service is a gig that is not exactly enjoyable, <laughs> no matter where you're working in the world or what industry, right? So, you know, how might we reduce those pain points, but also give more interesting incentives? So around that time, we were looking at rewards. And there were certain things where we would sell CDs in the stores. I don't know if anybody here is old like me and you remember those days, but you used to have kind of like a an artist of the week and they would be playing, you know, these... I'm dating myself now, but it, it, like even through time, it would be like Nelly Furtado and people like that. <laughs> it would be like, and the whole thing was to create this cozy vibe that was a replicatable thing. Um, and But that taught me a lot. That taught me a lot about what really mattered to people. For them, it was Wi-Fi. It was having access to cool new music they hadn't heard. So it wasn't just about playing the top 40. It was getting exposure to things and really understanding your customer. That was my first real foray into that. Um, and then really actually getting to wear the hat of in a job title way, a product lead. Um, they always called me product lead. I would definitely say there was a time as the, the fashion started turning and they always do. Um, where Scrum came into play. Again, working in consulting, you just follow the work. You invest in yourself to keep up with keep making yourself attractive. Um, and you do your best across the way as you as you go. So I, at that point, um, never returned to Scrum Mastery at that point in my career. But what I absolutely did do was get heavy into product, product ownership, proper product management, product directorship. I also dipped a little bit at certain points during recessions and things into lead scrum master or agile coach type roles. Um, I've always been quite happy to dip in and out according to the market. Um, that would lead to product coaching, true product coaching on value propositions, which is very different from the product process of scrum stuff. So how do you, how do you test the viability of an idea, take it to market, literally own that, literally be the person who would get sacked if it didn't go do well. But hopefully we're taking an experimentation approach so that we can pivot and we don't get sacked because we've done a great experiment led approach as we speak about in agility just in general. Um, and there was an emerging role that you may hear more increasingly called player coach is typically where an organization is quite complex. They bring you in and you're asked to coach, but you're actually doing the role as like an exemplar product person. So usually you would be given the job title of like product director. And that, and that was just so that people would have to kind of see you as a peer. Um, but your whole thing was to coach the organization, bring us on board, be a real leadership role and own that digital exemplar product. Um, and then I've done a, a heck of a lot of agile coaching type stuff from small stints that were dreadful to longer stints that were really joyful and really helped my career grow. And then, of course, moving into head of product, head of transformation, product transformation, director type stuff as well. So that's me. And, you know, I, I like this kind of metamorphosis diagram because it really um, it, it is exactly what I feel that I'm doing all the time. My growth hasn't stopped. I don't know everything. There's a particular book that I quite value greatly and re try to read once a year or so. You are not that smart. Um, and that's a really difficult one as you progress any career in product, um, that it is never going to be drag and drop. But that is my path. Right. So again, where have I done this? Here's some brands, and I'll talk you through this at the end and how I came about this. It's a very um, kind of 
kind of awkward, weird role. So you've got development and I'll, I'll do this at the end and bring it to life properly. But I, I want to show that, you know, I didn't have this really linear, tidy product evolution. I didn't start off as a business me or a business analyst and then become a product owner slash product manager and then go through that, that wonderfully streamlined Marty Kagan world of eBay, where it's product manager, senior product manager, you know, VP of product, perhaps head of product, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and then CPO. In fact, it, mine has been very much rooted in transformation and the experimentation about customer behavior. But what I can say and hold in my hands from that is that if you've ever ordered a Domino's pizza in your life, that was my app. If you have done Lego Find My Brick, that was my app. If you have a Capital One credit card, to be honest, that app today is pretty much what we created back then, only slightly slight enhancements and additional, I'm sure, streamlining of other processes and stuff. But from what I can tell, and I'm still a customer now, um, I can't tell a lot of big difference to the journeys there. Um, and there's some stuff we did for Craft Heinz as well, which I'm proud of, but it's AI and it's internal facing. It's an internal AI promo for forecasting tool as well. So that's me. And, you know, it's not a straight linear path. And I know that from the market at the moment, I began this right out the gates. I know that there are a lot of people who are very worried about the economy and the state of agile coaching. And, you know, you see Capital One is on here twice. That's, that's not a mistake. I, I actually helped play a key role with the original lean organizational change with Capital One. Um, I played an enterprise coach role there, but I was also accountable for a significant slice of the transformation and looking for ways to make their organization flatter. We sold off the Spanish arm of that organization. That was around the time of the first recession, um, disposed of a building in Nottingham, um, and really, really, really made our back office processes hyper efficient. So that was outsourcing a lot of things to Philippines. Um, as well as Bangladesh, uh, so that was help desk and for IT help desk and customer help desk and straight along the way, really challenging the organization to get its house in order to enable that much longer change initiative. And I know one of the biggest anxiety points for a lot of people in the agile coaching community, especially during just at, at the turn of the pandemic when we were coming out of it, was the big moment where everybody heard that Capital One were going to be letting go all of their delineated uh, roles, such as Scrum Master or Delivery Type. I think they it literally quite, there was just a ton of what I would consider execution layer type roles that they deemed were just no longer necessary. And that really freaked people out initially, thinking that they were throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Agile was out. Are we going back to old ways? And I did a lot at that time in the pandemic and the turn of the pandemic, trying to educate people that actually know like a part of this tra the transition plan is they would have carried that forward for a decade or more would have been around how do we get the whole organization to be agile, to have agile as just one tool in their toolbox. Because actually product people don't see product as anything to do with agility whatsoever. In fact, the process of Scrum to us is nothing to do with real product. It's not. Um, is there some training that you can give a product person who's working in a product owner role or maybe in a product manager role? Of course. Is there a very strong chance they're using agile practices and methods? Of course. But we wouldn't consider product to be about that. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. All right. So that's who I be. That's where I've been. Um, and yeah, I'm going to go into recapping. Uh, Roman and Jeff kindly did a talk. And this is on the YouTube, YouTube channel for AMI, uh, which has been posted in the comments. And we can post that later. But the, the, just type in Jeff's name on YouTube and it'll come up. But they did a really good talk about the two different takes that each of them had in terms of their interpretation of how can, you know, what is a product coach? And Jeff, I don't know if you want to kind of mob with me for a minute, pair a little bit and go back and forth. So, so 
I'll tell you which camp I'm in, but I'll play the Roman role because I understand this role very well. And then, you know, I think Jeff can also play his role as well. So um, the first camp is that a product coach is all about product, obviously. It's about, you know, deep understanding of the product management practices, of course. So some of that may be agile stuff for sure. Um, it could be the product life cycle, the product development life cycle, which is a slightly separate thing. Um, knowing when to sunset stuff, how we know when we've achieved market fit, those deeper product metrics, being conversant and things like data, stuff like that, making really strong uh, hypotheses and bets, not just about what features to build, though, about what is going to move the needle in a profit and loss account kind of way. Um, discovery, strategy, road mapping, business modeling, prioritization, I would add pricing place and et cetera. And I'll show you that in a minute as well. And also there is a fundamental belief across product people that in order to be an effective product coach, and I would actually venture to say that as we go into 24, 2024, if you don't have hands-on product experience, as in you have owned at least a digital product and you're on the journey to becoming the real deal in, in a fully owned proposition kind of way, that actually that isn't considered super valuable to most product functions, okay? Super controversial thing to say, but Jeff has a really great way of compartmentalizing how in some instances, actually that can be wrong and slightly short-sighted. Um, and you can choose to take on the stance, especially as you're entering into that space, to be a coach of product people rather than a product coach. Um, and then the last one that Roman uh, identified was that organizational uh, change piece and of course, ind in industry knowledge. So we would say that in addition to, it's not just about technology stack or solutions. You're not looking to be like a technical cloud, but that's not what we're really talking about. We're talking about the true markets that you're playing in, as in where you're, pro you're, you're doing business, what the different, horizons around research, planning, pricing, et cetera, is all about um, understanding the different facets and new nuances of segmentation around users, their needs, and keeping up with competitors, regulations, any big trends and massive pivots and bets that your competitors might be making as well. So that's a lot. And if especially if you're in a regulated organization, which we'll talk about a little bit more, it is really difficult for a product, a true product person who also gets to work with an agile team, a delivery team, right? To exist in one person for a really long time, especially for the UK market, we would have said that actually, or even Europe, I would say the whole of Europe, frankly, um, you would say that that's a lot to ask of one person because if you're regulated, you think about the horizon scanning they have to do. It's not just about this year and the turn of that horizon. It's about that future landscape and actually being able to keep up with regulatory changes, Every country you're trading and operating in will have different regulations and things you can and can't do. And, you know, if you're looking after an insurances arm, if you're looking after something like a banking currency insurance, any, anything like that, anything that is financial or healthcare, that is a specialist. And actually, in addition to the delivery and the planning of delivery and the research around delivery and working with all that tribe of people who are helping them to do that, they need that mental bandwidth and capacity to also be horizon scanning, horizon scanning around the actual changes around regulation and, and where the true industry of that value proposition is going. So it's only been in recent years that we've seen a lot more in a digital way where we're owning that full proposition. And again, I'll take you through that in a bit. Okay. So product coach is that real deal. I've done it. I can tell you how I've done it. I have scars on my back. I can tell you what failed. I have lots of techniques. It's no longer about me telling you the process of Scrum. I'm not going to show you a bunch of canvases. I am going to focus on the real hard skills around business, commercial, horizon scanning, the lot, all in one person. And preferably, if you're doing it in the way that Marty Kagan and others, you know, some of my former colleagues, and the U.S. would say is the right way now in 2023, 
um, it would be working with that Agile team as well, because that team is self-empowered. So Jeff, I don't want to spoil, because I've already spoiled poor Roman. Is gonna, I'm going to have to apologize to him later for botching his spiel, which was so much more elegant. And please do watch his spiel on, on YouTube. It was very lovely to listen to. But how do you compartmentalize a different approach to coaching of product people? So when, when Roman and I had this chat, it was partly to just position different perspectives. And I think You've already mentioned the term agile coach, which is another very loaded and loaded, loaded term with multiple interpretations. Even even something as potentially simple as a, as a scrum master role, organizations and individuals will have different interpretations of what that means. And so I think being aware of what other people mean when they say these terms, I think is, is really important. So I positioned this uh, as a different way of looking at it in terms of you don't have to be a domain expert. You don't have to have product management knowledge. You don't have to have hands-on product management experience to be able to coach people. And that's a controversial thing to say as well. And we actually had a question in the chat about, do you need to have product knowledge to be able to coach product owners, uh, product people? My view is if you're, if you're coaching, as per my definition of coaching, then you don't. And that can be incredibly valuable to not have that knowledge and the conversation that Roman and I had around was well actually is the is the subset on the left as the screen as you look at it is that not more akin to mentoring rather than than coaching but it's almost a moot point if an organization is hiring somebody as a product coach or creating a role for a product coach internally and this is what they mean and more importantly the personal people that you would be helping are looking for then almost what it's called is irrelevant so i think you can you can offer mentoring the best product people that i know have mentors they have people that they can draw on and get advice from and they can work with people that don't have that knowledge and can help bring that knowledge out of them through less loaded less experience based questions and support Lovely. So again, that's saying I'm not an expert. I'm not going to give advice. Now, I would want to reiterate that Roman never said he was taking on a delivery accountability as a product coach either. But what it, what what I find personally is that I do have more skin in the game. So I used to say even in agile coaching, right, I am not known for being passive. I can't stand it when we're wasting time. If I've got a group of agile coaches around me who are spinning around in circles for weeks, I can't bear it. I will intervene and I won't be nice. Um, and that's because I really believe that not only are we there to really serve our customers and create that value and delight our the the full organization and customers that we're serving, right? But we we really have to take that seriously because otherwise, as an industry, and I think that this is really exemplified in what some people are investing in, in terms of long-term change agents, which is what I would consider agile coaching to be, is that if we're not directly adding value to what we're trying to achieve for our customers and to maintaining a business that is considered really worthwhile, highly valuable, and makes us attractive as a business that we should exist because that's what customers are doing when they're transacting with us. It's not just that we've got a great product. Like more than ever, customers are worried about sustainability. They're worried about how we're treating our environment and our people around us and being kind and not taking from the countries that we're choosing to operate in. And it's that bigger picture stuff that really matters to them. Um, so again, I'm going to bring it back into terms that we should all know as agile people. Uh, I, for me, there's more value on the left. I'm not saying there's not value on the right, but the stuff on the left matters the most to me. And I definitely, later in this presentation, I really, where I said, I, I think I'm going to shake some people. And I have said it many times. I have a whole work, WhatsApp community of just product people, hundreds of people in Women in Product UK, um, where I'm a founding member. And all of them staunchly are of the position that agile does not equal product and that agile people should not be product coaching. Can they coach product organizations? Sure. Can they, can they help explain good practices on backlog management and things like that? Sure. 
but that does not equal product coaching in the spirit in which the actual profession exists today. And if you're finding that you're having a hard time breaking in, it's just because you don't have that tangible practi practical experience. And the reason I belabored the point on my own journey is because I want to remind you that I didn't have these things myself from the onset. And you'll show, you'll see later on in the presentation, like how I've had to then retool yet again. I'm, I'm coding again for the first time. I've had to go back to business school and do data management and uh, AI certification, like, like proper business school qualifications around that. I'm doing my MBA. There's lots of things to be relevant that we just, and again, it's very personal what you choose to invest your time in, but it's those hard, tangible skills and the experience that we have to tell. Not long ago, I was asked a specific question. I think it was meant to um, put me on the spot in some way. So I was giving a talk and someone in the session posted a very brave question in the chat. I was very happy to take it um, saying, well, you know, will you hire change people um, who are, who don't have three to five years experience. And the way that I handled that was that, you know, people who are working in change or any form of coaching role, in my opinion, it's not a, an entry-level role. It's not something we're not just trying. I know that a lot of these roles will pay more money than perhaps what you were doing before, and I completely respect that. I completely, I don't even, you know, that old saying, uh, again, I'm a nineties person, but you know, don't, don't hate the player, hate the game. I don't even hate the game. Right. I, I think it's all fair really, but I, I really would encourage you to get involved and change your mindset around having interesting capabilities that you can offer to, so that you can contribute to that, making cool products and interesting businesses and value propositions in the world. And I'm going to tell you towards the end of this slide, how you can get those things in, in an authentic way. So you're not lying. You're not, you're not having to overstretch um, the past uh, things that you've done or undermine those because those are valuable experiences. They're building blocks to building a unique thing that only you can bring to the table. Um, so don't fret. It's it's not a game over situation that you're not perfect. You're just like me and lots of others who have kind of had this interesting transformation roundabout tech centric career. And that's okay. You belong in product. And I was really proud when I heard at a recent Mind the Product talk that, uh, and I forgive me, I, I tried to find this talk again to find the guy's name and I couldn't find it, unfortunately, but he specifically said for a really long time, the world of product management has been very much a behind the velvet rope situation. It's been really hard to break in, but everybody product is for everyone. It's just, you have to find an authentic way. And also it's about talent. We don't just exist. Do you see why all these product people have been made redundant or even engineering teams? It's about efficiency. It's about making good product, making valuable product, making profitable product. And that's a very different skill set. And it's one you need to remain in constant humility around. And if you can, if you can achieve some exposure and networking and experience by stepping into this coach of product people role, that's just an authentic, wonderful expression to get your foot in the door. And you might choose to stay in that lane forever. You may simply say, I don't really want to be in this camp, but we in actual product would ask that you respectfully refrain yourself from calling yourself a product coach, if that makes sense, because in the market, it's, it's, it is a little bit, it is more than controversial. So it's, would you say, El, would you, would you go so far as to say then to answer VS's question, can somebody who hasn't launched their own product coach product people? You can be a coach of product people, but you cannot be a product coach. Okay. And that's the big, that's really the headline. That's the difference. Okay. If you're doing that, I will tell you that I have hundreds of people who would tell you how angry that makes them. And actually they want to let you in on everything that is worthwhile. They just want you to go about it in an authentic way. It would be like if you were telling a developer how to code effectively and then you were telling them things that you'd taught yourself, but it was very verbose or it wasn't backwards compatible, if that makes sense. If we have other engineers in the room, right? It's it's kind of like, you know, let's let's get some real experience and honor that experience as well. Again, it's super controversial. And I, I know full well in a room, I recently 
prolifically fell out with an agile coach not that long ago because I asked this agile coach to take a product management approach to something that we were making. But unfortunately, I just, it was just constantly stepping into that like facilitator thing. And actually that's not how we make and consistently deliver great product and to take accountability for the budget side of things, as well as the profitability side, that, that P and L aspect is the difference. And again, I know it's triggering. It's not an attractive subject even for me. Imagine where I am. I'm at a point in my career where the product people don't get me and the agile people don't get me. <laughs> Yet anybody who's, you know, looked at my career, like, okay, I, I do understand it. But again, it's not that beautiful linear product career that Marty Kagan is encouraging everybody to create from the onset, right? And again, I'll tell you why that is, okay? This is, I've got a couple of slides in here who are kind of re belaboring this point again, um, but it just says the, the, the kind of key points from that original talk on YouTube a little bit better. Um, Roman would say that it's about industry and company knowledge, um, product management skills as a fundamental pillar, some coaching skills. So there, you know, he's not disagreeing with Greg at all, or sorry, with Jeff at all. Um, but he, he definitely is saying that, you know, that's, that's a key part of it. You're not holding the pen on delivery. You're not going to be the person who's walked off if the thing tanks. However, if you are not helping to contribute to that success, again, it's like any other co coaching endeavor. If they're not getting a return on that investment, that's the bit that you'll be judged for. Um, and also the organization uh, change skills. So when I've been in a head of product role or a product director or a director of product management role, it's been all about building strong product people um, and also really strong, you know, making sure that we set them up right, um, continuous discovery, making sure that we're, you know, really challenging the organization to, to become as flat as we can instead of leaving that ecosystem far too long in a state of weirdness that frankly isn't conducive to agility or any form of real product management in the full sense of the word. Um, and of course, that fundamental platform is hand on hands-on product experience. And for Jeff, or Jeff, Jeff, Jeff is always going to say my, my stance is going to be professional coaching, not agile coaching. I'm going to be a professional coach at all time. And I'm going to not, it, whether he's coaching somebody in the house of par parliament or an executive or a product person, he's going to take that approach. And he knows that he can coach the heck out of anybody and help them in some way to be better in the way that is right for them and to bring about the change that they need. Is you think, have I done that well for you? I think we've taught a few times together now where I think that's how I've seen you explain yourself. Yeah. And my, my view of professional coaching is that I can switch hats so that it's perfectly acceptable for me in my role as a coach to step into mentoring or step into teaching. If if the person that I'm coaching is okay with that, wants that, and the situation um, calls for it. But yeah, my default stance would be, you know more than I do, rather than I know more than you do. Can I ask you about the, your, we have an interesting pillar here that is hands-on product experience. You've got that in there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, so trying to remember, I, Actually, I didn't really need to remember what I said there. I'll just say what I think now. So for me, it, it's still something there because I don't know anybody who hasn't got some product experience. We've all bought products. We've all used products. We've all spoken to people about products. We've all given feedback on them. We've almost always been in some kind of informal focus group or other. And equally, I think we are, our own careers are our products, I think. Yeah, maybe not everybody's as weird as me and has their own backlog at home and uh, a product owner who decides what needs to be done on the weekends. Um, but I think we, we, we've we all got some experience. Now, my point of putting it in there is that it, you don't need to have a huge amount. You don't need to be an expert, but you need to have some awareness of the context that you're operating within. Whereas Roman would put that very, very high. And it, I, I think you would put that very, very high. Um and I don't think that's necessarily wrong or right. Uh, I, so there's a bit of a chat going on and a bit of a conversation in the chat here about the um, what I'm what I'm hearing and other people perhaps hearing something different. So maybe we should clarify. So I'm, I'm hearing this is it may not be that 
a product coach would have to have that. But in the context that we're operating, the world that we're in at the moment, product people that you know, look at that term and look at that service and expect that capability. There may well be a time in the future where other people don't see that as a required capability for someone providing product coaching. If I interject as well, there are plenty of organizations where, especially in regulated industries, right, where no matter what we do, we're only going to really own the digital materialization of that product. We're not going to own the profit and loss account. We're not going to be accountable for pricing. We might be doing some horizon scanning and participating in that, but we've got to use UXR type person, which is right, um, making sure that we're not introducing biases and things like that. Um, and they still do that even with other organizations. But the point is, the more complexity there is in your organization, or maybe they're just simply very laggard. So they never went through any form of agile transformation. They never went through any theory of constraint stuff. And they, you know, maybe they never even did any big, bigger organizational change. Like I said, my background originally, I was doing a lot of deep transformation and behavior change for both the back office functions and also experimenting with how we drive customer behavior, right? So when I was with Domino's Pizza, it was my ass on the line, frankly. Um, nobody believed that anybody would want to go to their bedroom or the office or whatever and order a piece online because you just did it on Friday night. It was the classic blockbuster thing, right? Where that's date night and that's what we love doing. You know, why would I want to go to my computer? And and actually, if you really, really understand key pain points and what people didn't enjoy it was you can't hear me on the phone. Where's my pizza? Um, and also just the sheer amount of staff you had to have to field those calls and to handle these redundant questions that people didn't want to ask. Actually, they'd prefer to be self-sufficient. So how do you take that wicked problem and you run that in a market segmented way to prove out the viability of not just the concept, but how is the right approach to drive behavior? What are people up for? What are they not? What's the overall appetite? Can we make money doing this? How do, are we going to hire? Are we? We never had permanent members of staff that were drivers, or maybe some small franchises did. But do we make partnerships? Are we going to become app native and digitally native? What it? What is that really like? And will people want to look at an app on their phone? Is that real, or is that whole thing going to like implode around us as well? And we all know how that played out. So that's product to me. That's, you know, so it's a big, and you you all should be comfortable with this comment. It's a big, and it depends. It depends on the organization. It depends on what everyone, how they divide accountabilities. And I have a separate talk about product management, if you want to get into that. Um, this kind of touches on it a little bit, and we'll get into more of my specific point that could be a good education point for agile people. I'm doing this talk specifically for agile people who think that the product owner role is product. And I'm telling you now, if you come to any product true conference, I mean, why do product people, real product people, why are they not coming to agile conferences? Why are why is agility kind of devalued over time? It's because it's, it's frustrating. Sorry. That was that was uh nothing. I mean, nothing. I don't think that was a question. That's fine. I thought I thought there was a her like a horrific reaction there, but you know, <laughs> they're not coming to our conferences. Why? Because they'd rather be going to the product conferences where they're talking about the real emergent tech stuff and you know how we're engaging customer behavior and how we're changing it and who's doing what and you know. You know, it's funny the things that you'll hear from like the vacuum cleaner industry that turn out to be relevant, similar, di completely different contexts, different problems, but they actually turn up to be existent in pharmaceuticals, right? Like that is the kind of cool stuff that product people are interested in. So again, this is from Roman and Jeff's original talk, but a product coach in terms of the classic sense of how a lot of people think of it is, you know, obviously a focus on product in some guys or another, um, that could be coaching product people, including heads of product. That could be about the process of product activities, techniques, methods, canvases, um, metrics, running classes, training, um, and at least having some form of deep knowledge of product management. And you might be on one side of the, the school of thought like Roman, or you might be on the other one like Jeff, or you could be somewhere in the middle. 
Because I think that I'm a little bit in the middle myself, but I simply value the real tangible hard skills of product a lot more, especially at this juncture in transformation than I do on the ones on the right, right? Um, and then agile coaches, you know, you know, the classics, they focus on agility, practices and processes, coaching of developers, educating stakeholders, deep knowledge of agile. They do cross over because they will coach product owners. Again, a product owner does not mean, especially in an enterprise organization, that they own the thing we are selling. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. It doesn't mean that they're looking after any of the classic marketing stuff. We've seen big changes in Airbnb around that yet again, because they had a different starting point. They were digitally native from the onset. And also over time, they're really competent product management people who owned the full piece, as well as the work with the teams. Of course, like they've upskilled and they've invested in themselves and they've developed and they can handle marketing too. But that doesn't mean everybody can. And that doesn't mean that there's one right way that is drag and drop or that we can parachute that approach in. It, it really, it's a journey. But I think that where there's a bit of disappointment in the market with this agile coaching industry and being really open because I want to help in some way um, for people who really want to, to have that, um, you know, but the main thing is, you know, being honest about that, being honest about, you know, we are in 2023 going into 2024, we should have seen some big strides and transformation going forward. So the key points for me are as agile coaches and scrum masters, I think that a lot of them will have this common blind spot due to no fault of their own. It's just simply because they focused on the product owner side and the deep knowledge of agile side, because that's all they were given the liberties or afforded the um, exposure to. They they weren't involved in more of this other side. So the difference and the, the big bugbear, the fly in the ointment is really about the real deal product management side of the coin is about proposition ownership profit and loss, pricing, place, promotion. And if those are new concepts, those are actually from marketing. So they're called the four Ps. Um, and basically it's about where should we be doing business? What price should we set it at? If you're working in insurances, they'll want you to be able to demonstrate that you can price a contribution, meaning if I have to give a, a discount, a volume discount, or to attract renewals, how do I offset that? Place is about markets and also the channels that we might surface that in. Maybe we're going to choose in certain markets not to offer digital at all. Look at Primark, for example. That's a really strong example of someone who has made a very specific and deliberate decision to do business only in person, or I think that's still the case. I've, I've heard that they're starting to explore a digital experience, but I'm quite sure I've heard the founder say that that is his desire to this day. And of course, promotion around that. So in, in terms of marketing, um, and it's nothing new It's like most things, it's the concept, if you've ever seen Mad Men, it's been around since 1950. Oh, might be a good Good opportunity. Becca's got a question, which is if a product manager doesn't have full PL accountability, would you say that that's not a product manager, that that's a dysfunction? I would say that most product people, in fact, the strongest chief product officers I know have joined the business and within a very sharp, I mean, within a month, if not overnight, I know one in particular who works in ed tech, who literally just redesigned the career path and they owned the full thing. Now, that's not to say that she hasn't chosen to keep a couple of particular people. Obviously, she's got lots of ideas. Some of the platform guys, they just need to run the engine. That's simply okay for that context. But by and large, she felt strongly and lots of chief product officers do feel strongly that it is not an anti-pattern, but it's definitely not right. And that we should be making strides towards that. But as you can see, this is where the proposition lies. This is where maybe we would call digital product manager exists. And the organization, your board, frankly, they're the only ones who can really decide on how to approach that. And forgive me that we're going to whiz by this, but we've just gone through so much um, so quickly. And I wanted to give a good uh, you know, space for everybody who wanted questions as well. Um, but the point is, who was doing what? We used to just talk about like the that wonderful triangle, you know, all that stuff. Like it's it's grown, it has changed, it has moved on, and it should have moved on. And if your organizations are staying stagnant, 
I'm sorry, even as an agile coach, if you tell me you want to win Wimbledon, I got to tell you if your form's off, I got to tell you if your technique's off, I'll ask you, can I offer a thought? And I'm not going to be on the hook for your win at Wimbledon, but I am going to be in your, you know, behind you fully and making sure that you achieve the goals or make at least the strongest effort to achieve those goals that you possibly can. I will send these slides to anybody who wants them as well. Okay, so don't feel like you have to, to address them. But the main thing that this I is horribly trying to tell you is that most companies are sales and marketing led. They are not product led. Most companies, a lot of companies still have proposition owners and they'll have at best a digital product manager. Very often, really old companies or very complex or regulated and slightly laggard companies, a lot of these big insurance arms, for example, they'll have product owners instead. So in other words, they simply accept that these guys, as well as their directors and their boards, they will own what we're going to sell, how much should we charge, what channels should we offer that from. But we're also going to accept that really, although the product owner does own the strategy for the digital side of things, that it's not really the strategy for how the company is going to get there. That's going to sit with propositions still. And again, over time, the hope would be that we kind of transition into that product space. And that means you own the whole thing, including PL, EBITDA, market growth, you know, trying to, you know, show and, and try true things that you would get from your MBA program, right? On how you can grow that, make it more profitable, um, experiment with how it should be sold. Um, and maybe you get to the point where you're completely redesigning whole value propositions like we did with Bupa, for example, right? Or, or definitely if you look at some of my past clients like um, Lloyd's Banking Group, they're actually working with fintech companies now. We weren't doing that then. Um, and it's because they're deciding that actually product management can take a new proposition and make it either at least digital first. So we're not going to take this new insurance offering or retirement plan and then try to find a way to sell that online. We're gonna make it digital first, and we're gonna find every way to create all aspects of that experience fully in that digital package, including the analytics on how you track the markets, you connect into Bloomberg and, and the other things that you need to monitor when you're keeping an eye on the, the trading floor, all that stuff right there in a hub. It's a very different experience. And then uh, also, you know, you've got, and a lot of people have had a running start, right? You can't compare Lloyd's Banking Group to something like, uh, you know, now a dom what Domino's would be. They, I'm, I believe they've completely rebuilt that app. So it is app native, um, but they still have a digital, like a web version that you can engage with. But if you're looking at real app native or digitally native products, that would be your Airbnbs of the world, you know, that sort of thing. And of course, if you start lean, you have the opportunity to become leaner and to grow skill sets and things. But even they, they will have, if you look at real product structures in terms of the modern way that Marty Kagan talks about them, the most junior level role is associate product manager. It'll be product manager and senior product manager, kind of the same thing. Um, maybe they're individual contributor type roles who are looking after that full scale delivery, so strategy and ex execution in one person. And then we'll have like a VP of product looking after, you know, kind of a little bit across market or maybe looking after a particular planning horizon and making trade-offs about certain aspects. Maybe they're getting hands-on with some discovery um, to look at early options and keep that machine moving for our product managers. But again, the idea is to do that in a lean way. So we're avoiding handoffs. That's the one uh, cardinal sin we want to avoid. <sighs> so how do you break in now? How do we do that? So I'm bringing you back to mine. And somebody really hit the nail on the head right at the beginning when we joined. I had a few moments where I broke in in a big way, but I also had to make a way for myself. And I did that by starting a couple of my own endeavors. So I, I had an online magazine for five years. We achieved 2.1 million, 2, 2 million subscribers a month consistently for that entire time. And we had advertisers. Now, I wasn't making big bank, bank from that. It really just was enough to keep it going and to pay people to, to do it. And we had a really good time doing it. And then, of course, I am constantly offering my own services, just like a lot of you, because I've gone freelance, right? So reluctantly, I will say I was an accidental freelancer. It, that was just the be all end of all of it. But it was a good trade-off to make 
because it's given me a lot. Um, and I'll show you. Oh, and then the other thing is charity trustee roles and non-executive director roles, things that you can do to get that hands-on practical experience, both in terms of that classic nose in, fingers out kind of way of good governance. You know, how do you run a good company, coaching the organization, really making it's sure so that all it. Really making I've heard people speaking there. I think it was somebody just joining in. I've muted them. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, no problem. So, you know, classically speaking, if you're in a trust, a charity trustee role, you won't be running the business. You're not doing roles within it. But what you are doing is making sure that the original intention and spirit of the people that are designed to benefit from that charity or that nonprofit endeavor are actually getting what you say on the tin that you do and that you are running it in a compliant way, in an honest way, in a transparent way, getting involved again with corporate governance, which is, you know, such an important thing, especially if, again, getting that regulatory experience is really very important um, and then finding other ways to get it. And again, my career <laughs> went like this. It was co pure code, coding in my bedroom, coding for clients, uh, becoming an uh, extreme program team lead, uh, true management consulting work, working in a marketing-led transformation, um, using theory of constraints, creating store experiences and value propositions like Wi-Fi, silly stuff that now we take for granted, but actually were a real question at the time if we should be paying for that for customers because everybody had that wonderful MSN and AOL thing at home. Um, what about things like uh, transformation experience, um, I served as a brain trust coach within Pixar for a good stint and working with hair and fur at a, as a team. We just called me a flow master for that particular gig. But, you know, the reality is I got a lot from that because I got to see all about the different aspects of the organization from how to reuse a procurement pro uh, contract uh, once and leverage that as an asset around the world, how do you sprinkle the magic on a film and make sure that it's gonna give that nice feel that it should? Did I give that advice? No, but I facilitated it. And I actually picked up a lot of hands-on experience from how observing how people think and how they approach their extremely impressive problems that they're owning and accountable for. Um, working in loads of different banks and insurance type gigs, I have not been humble. I, well, I've been very humble. I've not been too proud in times when the market's been crap to step into agile coaching or perhaps senior scrum master roles or to be a team product owner for a stint. I was asked to do that at Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, I was hired as an agile SME, as they, they called it. Um, doing my own thing with my magazine, getting the real deal product experience a few times, and again, networking my my butt off to, to get some of these things and getting people to take a chance on me, sometimes former bosses, things like that. Um, brushing off my developer skills, getting the ability. To, so around the time of Lloyd's Banking Group, I, again, just went to Code Academy and became a full stack developer again. Um, why? Because in order to write better stories and to help motivate my teams and to at least be a part of the solution, I needed to make sure I wasn't looking to be a developer who coded. I, I just wanted to be able to help them and to be more effective at my job and to hopefully not pass the buck all the time. Um, coaching product people, coaching teams, helping to inject good practices, Coaching, coaching, coaching in all things, retraining in AI and data, getting some head of product experience. I heard, I think, Ash from the NHS. I think that was the person who said that he was going to be moving into a head of product role. I assume that's head of digital product. That's perfectly fine. That's when I've been a head of product. That's exactly where I've been sat in the organization myself. Um, and again, there's no two organizations that are alike for all the things. And then more recently, Bupa, where I basically had no delivery accountability for anything, which was beautiful. And I led an internal consulting arm of deep tech experts where you can imagine my particular offering for people around the world were about customer journeys, mapping out the pain points with that, testing for frictionless um, delivery and helping really to play that chief digital officer type role slash product transformation role that can grease the wheel, teach it, do it, share it, 
hopefully write a pattern and asset and architecture and approach and scale it so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel 26 times around the world. Um, and that's my career. Your career is going to go, I mean, look at Capital One. Like I went around the spaghetti junction and then had to, vol I mean, I'm still volunteering. I'm helping with uh, the product pathway with the Agile Mastery Institute with Jeff, right? I'm helping with Women in Product UK. It never ends. And it sometimes can feel a little bit relentless. But as long as you're getting a return on that investment of time, of the skills exchange, the reward, following your passions and the topics that you actually want to be involved in, that that's all that matters. And only you can measure the worth of your career. If you're not happy, if you are feeling triggered that somebody else is being given opportunities, I would really ask you to look at Roman's version of a product coach. And I want you to really say, I mean, honestly, when I feel jealous or I am you know, maybe obsessing over anything, I try really hard and I'm not a perfect person, but I try really hard. Eventually I do get there where I'll ask myself, am I actually wanting to do that? Is that something in me that needs to grow or change? Is it time for me to go back into that chrysalis and retool, reskill, go back and get a new qualification, whatever it may be? Ask yourself, where in these quadrants are you light? where do you need education? And I know for so long, we used to really bash proper formal education. And I know a lot of people are anti-certification. All of that is valid, but there are things that real formal education can give you. And some of that stuff you can't get elsewhere unless you go through the entrepreneurial work. And then you have a much more rich uh, lived experience anyway that nobody could ever teach if they tried, right? Both are valid and you need a bit of both, in my opinion. I think that that's been made really clear from both Roman and Jeff's original talk. Um, and don't be afraid to get a mentor. Find creative ways to get experience. I talked about charity boards. There's training you can get for that. It doesn't cost a lot. You can uh, train as a non-executive director. And especially if you want to be a charity trustee, around 150 pounds, and you get to learn about governance. They'll help you role play and actually find charities you can get involved in. There are lots of outside the box ways. We used to tell, so I, I've been co-training with Tobias Mayer for a long time as well, and really helping to lead um just play a kind of scrum master role in a lot of his trainings, because for a long time, I was really thinking, do I want to be a scrum alliance trainer, you know, and do I really want to get in bed with that? Or is that going to napalm my product career? Because honestly, that's been a state of analysis paralysis, paralysis for me for a really long time. Um, but I mean, he, he would argue that you, you know, the best people in the world are people from a completely different background, but he would never say that, you know, if, if you were a big fan of Lisa Atkins, you know, she never said, stop growing that, you know, x-ray thing, you know, where it talks about the different stances that you can be in and the different forms of mastery and stuff. We never said go deep in one and don't expand on the other. I think that's where we've gotten a bit lost in the agile industry overall, we were supposed well, to I'm just going to interrupt. You've got one minute left. Yeah, no problem. I am pretty much done. So continuous learning and skills development is where it's at. And do not think that once you're a butterfly, that's you done. You can have multiple reinventions in your career and in your life at any phase. And a lot of people go back to medical school. They do lots of things in their late 40s and even 50s. And they create a brand new life that they love. So that's me. And I'll stop sharing and just say any questions or strong reactions you want to vocalize before we go. I'm sorry that was so fast and whistle stop style, um, but there was a lot to try and get across to you. I must say, El, this has been an eye-opening session. I mean, the the way the way you ex because as soon as we are into coaching, we think that. Oh, we're capable. You, if I've done product owner role for two years, and currently I'm doing product delivery, so I coach product owners. Um, but the clear distinction that coaching product owners versus coaching product managers or at the product office level is a different thing. So this helped me identify where my strengths and weaknesses lie. Thank you. Oh, good. Guys, we are just on time unless anybody has a very burning question. 
I'm sure Elle can monitor the meetup chat if somebody hasn't got to hang in. Hermione? Yeah, I was going to ask a really quick question. Um, I mean, the usual question of how do you how do you quantify the value that you add when you're in that company, in that role? I mean, that's usually a question that's asked to Agile coaches. And, and I'm one, and I'm just wondering, I'm sure you get the same. Hi, Al. Amani, I, I just texted you before. We're part of that WhatsApp group. So hello. First time Hi. putting your face to the name. So yeah, well yeah. done. But yeah, I was just wondering, do you get that question? I'm sure you do. How do you respond to it? Absolutely. So um, really strong thing I should have said in the onset of the Jeff versus um, Roman approach and my approach is that it's all about contracting, right? Contracting, goal setting, reminding them that they set that goal. Having a visualization of that is super helpful. Having your own backlog. You guys are agilists. You should be able to bring that to the table pretty quickly, right? So, you know, finding a way to show like, hey, you know, I'm a coach and I'm not accountable for your delivery, but what have the priority, have this, has the priority changed? Have your goals moved on? And, you know, again, much like Jeff, at a certain point in my career, especially when I got to leadership roles where you're accountable for the success of the collective, but not any one thing in particular, other than the success of the people that you're managing and their products, right? You need a lot stronger mentoring skill set and you need a lot stronger coaching skill set which is why i completely believe that much of what we're teaching in the product pathway for ami is actually a good now there's some hard skills that need to be tacked on and we're doing that and a lot of that is already there within the pathway but certainly stepping into that true visualization practicing what you preach to your own customers is really going to help you um, and also making sure that you're getting regular feedback, wh whether that's return on time invested using like something like fist of five or thumbs up, thumbs down, and really critically saying, what would make this more valuable to you? What are your problems? What are we solving as a team? You talk about that in agile coaching all the time already in scrum mastery, right? So just take it up a notch and make it about the product landscape, how that's making an impact to the company's profitability and all these other aspects that we've been talking about. I think contracting is a really important piece there, Amani. I, I back that up. I, I'm judged differently by different teams, different organizations, different people. And and asking the question, so how, how are you going to know that you've got value from me? You know, I can say this is how much my support is going to cost. How are you going to know that's worthwhile in your context? And usually it's a variety of factors. Um, effectiveness, greater outcomes greater confidence and some of them are more tangible and easily measurable than others but having that regular checking in so how do you think this is going how are we doing in terms of this right now is this something you want to keep going with is this something you want to double down on is this something you want to scale back and i think every team every organization is going to be different but it should be contributing in some way towards their their target metrics yeah thank you so contracting recontracting continuously yeah, and just have those um, just open questions like you know, I you know, are you getting the best out of me right now? Or do we need to pivot? Just recontracting as often as possible. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and and also from the other side of the coin, make if you're in product coaching mode, making it about the product, making it about its performance, what you're learning about your customers, about what's changing across the landscape. I say this to a lot of the people that we're teaching the pathway with, right? At the moment, it's if you can make it about the work. Everything is desensitized. It's more practical. It's less of a heated conversation, even if still the work occasionally does become heated, right? So yeah. Brilliant. Not an easy answer. Thank you, Elle. Thank you everybody for joining in. Those are questions and comments in the chat as well. We will upload the recording. We'll upload the slides, and, uh, probably the chat transcript as well, if I can do that. Uh, and Elle's easily contactable through through various media channels, LinkedIn and so on. And I know from a, from my own personal experience, she's more than happy to, to, to chat. So reach out. Thank you for joining. And next month, we've got something on emotional intelligence. So look out for an announcement on that meetup session shortly. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you. Oh.